see now that's annoying because I just updated my OS and it's got this you don't care but it's just seemed a big screen and now I can't see my questions this is such a professional start um, so I, I can't see my contents and you can't see your questions yeah, we, we, this would be perfect <clears throat> Hello and welcome to this episode of The Insider, brought to you, as you jolly well know, by Vanishing Inc. Um, my guest today changed the face of modern mentalism. Ooh. It's Darren Brown. Darren, how are you this evening? I'm very good, thank you. I've just changed my face. Well, that, I, I, I like the one you've got. It's, it's, I don't know what that means. It's fine. Um, no, it's nice to meet you. Thank you very much for having me, uh, having me on. Well, thank you for doing it. Is um, that a guitar and linking rings, by the way? Yes, it's a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a thing I'm working on, on where I so link, link <laughs> rings whilst... Act. Yeah, it's very niche, but when you find your audience, it resonates mm. so well. Yeah. What do you think people get wrong when it comes to mentalism? Whoa, straight in. What do I think? Okay. Um... <clears throat> I think it can be very indulgent. Um, okay. And I think part of the problem of that is there's this sort of slightly lazy thought that, oh, it's all about presentation, as if the rest of anything isn't or that it should be any more or less about that. Um, and I think that can uh, it can lend itself to a sort of... Um, this sort of uh, the mentalist feeling he or she has a sort of aura about them, like mm-hmm. they have a sort of a status that the audience is supposed to sort of just sort of buy into. And I, I, I think that's just sort of, it's just silly. It's really wrong and it really misunderstands how any performer should be coming out in front of an audience. You know, you really have to, you have to earn any sort of status. You know, if you're going to pontificate about how clever you are, you really need to have just done something very clever in order to earn that, if, if it's a good idea ever. So the idea of, you know, just sort of coming out and imagining you already have sort of somehow earned it out of the air is just silly. So I think there's a, there is a lot of that and there's a lot of um, kind of... Um, it's it's the playing of status that's the problem. You know, if you've if you've got the if you've got the if you've genuinely as a performer have the status or want to have it, you you should play against it anyway. I mean, you you the, as soon as you start playing any sort of high status role, I mean, it, it's sort of it's just gonna it's gonna really just make you uh, annoying so i think i think all those all those problems that are already there i think with a lot of magic are just sort of <laughs> exacerbated <laughs> by mentalism which is so prone to pomposity magic and squared also, also, equals mentalism yeah 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 and there's also um i think uh because there's again it's sort of related to the same area that's all about presentation but because there's often less going on in terms of uh, props and, and stuff that what's left really perhaps more than magic and this is what I think people are getting at when they talk about this whole presentation is that what's really key is the relationship between the um, mentalist and the audience certainly but, but particularly which is something never really spoken about or thought about something I write about a lot is the um, the relationship between the mentalist and the the person on stage taking part, the, the, the participant, um, like those things suddenly become really key because there isn't a, a necessarily a visual trick. There's not rabbits appearing or disappearing. Or, there's not other stuff to look at that sometimes you can get over the fact the magician's a bit unlikable or maybe just sort of invisible. It's sort of maybe it's just, mm. maybe it's just about the rabbits. Um, but with mentalism, often the, just the, the personality of the performer and our personalities only really come out in relationship to somebody else so therefore the relationship with this other person on stage all those things become so important and sure. i think that's um it's a, a tricky thing to get right um and uh I, you know prob- probably often wrong not not saying i get it right or that anyone's stupid for getting it wrong i just think those those things are really delicate issues not very often spoken about and precisely what this book yeah, you, I've written. It's exactly it's, what it's you do exactly talk about what, in the book. It's exactly yeah. what the book's about, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like we'd arranged these questions. Is it flattering or annoying, and I've done my research, and it works out that it's 98% of mentalists performing today are clones of you. Um, is, is it flattering or annoying? Or something I else? Never, I, I, I don't even know if that's still the case. I think it was definitely a, 
Uh, maybe you know more than me. I, 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 at first, it was, it was a bit galling because some of those tricks, like you know, coin in hand mm-hmm. or, or whatever, or the idea of, I don't know, getting to the end of the show and but, um, predicting. Mm-hmm. You've done a prediction. You know, there's a thing that you've been influencing people all along, and here's the big thing that you all fell into, and here's the proof that, and all those things that I guess are sort of tropes that got started. Those took a lot of thinking about and like hard work and months of you know uh, particularly the i remember the um like the coin in hand thing i remember us really puzzling over and i think it was for mind control too the idea of a, something that would just feel like a game that had always been around right. something you'd always something you played as a kid but not i mean like rock not, paper scissors or something exactly yeah exactly that's really difficult i think actually i think it was richard mcdougall who was part of the creative team for that show that uh, came up with it as a, a as an idea. Um, I think it was him that provided the thing. So there was just a lot of work and a lot of thought and head scratching. And then you know, within six months, it's in the magic shops as this old this old thing. You know, the classic of mentalism that's been around forever. You know, and it's it's which is sort of ironic because that's what we were aiming for. Pretending, um, to be, yeah, yeah. So it's that it was galling at the beginning, and it was sort of odd. And then I um I thought, well, this is either going to annoy me for a long time or, or I need to find a, a, a strategy to not be annoyed by it. So I decided to make friends as much as I could with, I've got my squeaky chair if you're picking up on that. Um, we'll fix it in post. Uh, thank you. Um, to, yeah, to, to make friends with many of the annoying mentalists <laughs> as, as, I, as I could. And it worked because then I did, you know, didn't find it annoying if I liked the person. So that, that lasted, that went on for so long and then there were perhaps too many. <laughs> And now I, now I, I, um, I don't really think. I don't know if it's in my mind. It's not still the case. I sort of find myself a bit irrelevant now, as far as the magic community goes. I imagine everyone's moved on, and um, as far as who you're going to emulate, I sort of feel my, that moment for me is past anyway. And if um, I, you know, as in there are other models around, I imagine now. Uh, I do see it a lot. I see. Um, just you know, lines from my show and gags mm. and stuff, and tr- I, I, and just things that are a bit more ephemeral being used, and I kind of, I guess it's just part of the you know part of the course, and um, you know, uh, just sort of what what happens, and I you have a, you do have a choice whether you're going to be bugged by it and try and stop it, which is so silly uh, and impossible, or just sort of be kind of flattered by it and then just not really, not just not think about it. I don't see a lot of mentalism. I don't see a lot of mentalists perform, p- partly because of that, perhaps perhaps the worry that it, it would bug me. Um, uh, I also think part of the problem is there's not, you know, in magic, there's so many different types of magicians around that if you're starting out and you, you're you looking for a role model, even not necessarily consciously, but, you know, just seeing someone that you yeah, really like. Yeah, how am I going to start? Yeah. Yeah, there's like 50 different styles of doing magic it seems whereas with mentalism um it just seems a lot more limit more limited so you know the chances are you're going to hone in on one of you know four sure ways of doing it and i remember when i started i mean it was mentalism was a very niche thing it felt to me like there were about four mentalists in the mm, world that were mm. that were doing it i'm sure there were more but it in my mind, there was I could think of me, and there was Graham Jolly and Ian Nyman, Rowan, I got, I got to know Mark Paul, Nyman, Mark Paul, and uh, yeah. I mean, uh, obviously there were more, but, yeah, it, but in terms of yeah, it, it was it, it, it was niche, yeah. Um, so uh, and, and that, that's a shame because there should be as many ways of doing it as there are people. Um, sure. I remember seeing, um, or as you know, as there are performers. I remember seeing Stephen Long do his show in Edinburgh, and um, but it was fairly early on in my career, so there were definitely a lot of a lot of people that were sort of doing it in that in that mould, whatever that is. Um, and it was sort of wonderful his show because it, it just had there was nothing, there was no no sense of me, and it was totally him. And I don't know if you know Stephen Long, but he's a very distinct character and just just one of the best human listeners or readers may be more familiar with his work as hector chadwick as hector chadwick um but he is a a magnificent human being and the show totally encapsulated him and um it should be like that shouldn't it? i remember seeing a a 14 15 year old uh guy um the magic circle once come out and 
he was introduced as, you know, this next, this next kid's only 15, and he came out and did his act like a little miniature corporate adult. And it was such a shame. I thought, oh, no, no, if you're 15, be 15. Yeah. Like, that's, that's interesting. Now, there's stuff to bring to it. So it'd be lovely if we could all do that, if we could all sort of bring ourselves. It's so hard. It is so hard. And, of course, you part of the creative process is to copy and to... You know, and that is that's part of the. You don't always copy. You need to find your way through and out of it. But it is absolutely part of how you grow as any sort of. Yeah, I don't think it's an awful. You, I don't think no, it's an awful you, thing you, to start off. You have to. You just have to. So you, you know, you, you have to take it with a pinch of salt when people say it's just bad to copy. I think, but, but there comes a point when you once you know you should move on and you don't. That's not good. Or if you're using people's lines and so on. I mean, that, that isn't... Obviously, that's not good. And if you're... Um, something I see a lot is if you're uh, specifically making changes to your act so it isn't like somebody else, <laughs> then you're too, you're, you're too close, you know, the, the ship sail. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I always have the um, image that stayed with me when I was starting off as a magician and I went to... Um, uh, there was a popular act that used to appear a lot in... Um, magic gala shows where people would make records of vinyl appear. It was like a yes. classic minip, minip act, right? Yeah. And um, and there was a moment when it changed to people producing CDs, and there was one act, and forgive me, anyone, if you're listening to this and it was you, but there was, I just remember seeing, it was a big fuss around how magic could be modernised, <laughs> and it was now CDs, rather than and I was there, even as, even as a newbie, a newbie in magic, thinking, hang on, isn't it just the, isn't it just the same? <laughs> the same thing, you're just producing a different object. So I think there's a, 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 a lot of that. My mind goes back to that a lot. It's just you know, CDs instead of one. Sometimes doing the same thing with a different object can be quite good, though. So the... the who was it? Del Guardio? Someone weird did the piano trick from Royal Road with the pairs of cards in the fingers oh, with, yeah. with socks. And it that was Stephen Long. Oh, was it no, Stephen it Long? Well, hang on, hang on. No, no, he did one uh, trick with socks. May not have been Stephen. I think David Williamson also did a thing with socks. Didn't anyway, he? so my point um, was anyways, that, yes, that doing but, things yeah. the same thing with a different object can sometimes be good. Very true. But cards to socks yeah. is a bigger change than vinyl to CDs. <laughs> yes, that, I can't yeah. argue with that. Um, how did you meet that there Andy Nyman? And how did that mm. collaboration influence your approach and your work oh good question so i uh i can't remember the moment of meeting andy i suspect it was at a magic convention and we would have chatted um i was very uh self-absorbed in my early days of magic convention so i may not have noticed anybody i met <laughs> um and then just uh, crushed velvet and gorgeousness uh, just crush velvet and, and sort of broken <laughs> ego, and then I, um, I. Uh, but then what? What sort of happened next? And what started off this kind of relationship that we have was that um, Andrew O'Connor and Michael Vine, who ran Objective Productions, I'm sure this is a story you've heard before, but they were looking for someone that would do this, and because there were not many people doing mentalism. Uh, it was hard to find somebody, but they had gone to Andy. Andy had turned it down because, although he would have been phenomenal in that role, he really wanted to focus on acting, and yeah. quite rightly, he thought it would just get in the way. Um, so, uh, but he offered himself as a consultant. So then they found me, and they liked me, and they signed me out. This is back in 1999 or something, just before the first Mind Control special. Andy came in as a consultant, and I think he was massively influential for me. Cause I, so I had my way of doing it, and luckily the, um, that company, Objective Productions, was a small production company specialising in magic shows. Andrew had been... Um, Andrew was a magician, Michael was a magician. They all lived and breathed magic, so they got that... Um, they got to... They, they saw whatever it was in me and nurtured that as opposed sure. to what I think has happened a lot since is this is popular. This type of magic is popular on TV. So we need to create somebody else that does that. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I'm sure I was an answer to David Blaine or whatever that was happening at the time. So, but, but so it was a lot of, it was out on the street and so on. So there was clearly a bit of that going on, but generally speaking in terms of how I was within that group, it was very much, we like this guy and, um, 
how do we bring that to the fore? So, uh, you know, naturally I had a lot of terrible indulgent habits and, and, you know, a very different, but very we're different performers. And I think, um, what he, uh, what he really instilled in me and particularly on stage, uh, was, um, performance energy and things that I didn't really know much about. And I think when I look back at the early performances, I can see a lot of Andy in there. Andy's performance very much on his front, mm-hmm. the balls of his feet. Sure. And that, that's on your balls, on your balls. It's quite a sort of theatrical <laughs> thing of just being literally kind of leaning forward. And he's like, when you watch Andy perform, he's like a, a prize fighter. That's his yeah. sort of thing. And I imagine that um, Fogel had a similar um, feel about him. So I, when I look back at those early shows, I... <coughs> Sorry, pneumonia. Um, I, uh, I I see myself as more. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of that in in the air, and I think over the years I found myself more as a performer, and I've sort of I can see myself li- literally back, literally sort of you know sort of re- relaxing a little more. So I find it a bit um, sometimes a oddly high energy, like I talk quite quickly and so on. Um, but I think uh, Andy. Um, and and Andrew and you know the team is really um, yeah obviously the team is more than just Mr Nyman yeah hugely 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 formative and um, I suspect on stage more than anything because that's where you're shaped as a performer whereas yeah. TV a lot of it is the, the the edit is what makes the you know the, the atmosphere of the show yeah now my uncle taught me magic and he says that a are you good... about to go into a trick no. <laughs> My dead grandfather picked me this mm, car. There um, is. Uh, he says that a good, unusual, surprising reveal mm-hmm. is way more important than a method. Mm-hmm. Do you think he's right? Of course. Yeah, of, of course. Um, so why, do, why does everyone obsess with method? Because that's the delicious stuff that is so satisfying as a, as a performer. And I, 90% of magic isn't ever really performed for real world people it's just stuff you do for your friends and for your own pleasure so yeah um uh, but for me i think for me a satisfying method like um i, remember, I think it was i think it was richard dawkins in the god delusion saying that evolution is a very good theory because it's a simple thing survivor of the fittest that explains so much you know everything all of life and evolution is a sorry and creation is a bad theory because the thing old God did it begs so many other questions that it's right. sort of weirdly a bit top heavy. But what you want is a simple idea that creates the biggest effect. And um, so for me, a, a satisfying magic method is is about that. And I always prioritize that. I, I, I like to sort of enjoy, I like, you know, in, in, enjoy the, the doing of it and that side of it. So it isn't for me about anything complicated at all my i think my methods as far as the shows go are are i like a sort of big and soft and just sort of no one's really no one really minds that that's my that's my sort of weird (laughs) picture of as opposed to furtive or um elaborate or whatever i i just sort of i i like the idea that it's just all a Things here and there, and they create they create the, the biggest effect, you know. And, and time and um, like time is a lovely uh, again. It's something I write about in the book, but um, it's so sort of underused. And you know, people don't think of time as a method. As in, you you know, you you drop something in earlier on, and then later on you pick up on it, and there's the satisfaction of of sort of oh, this is a thing from earlier on, but you've also forgotten, and you, the story has been reframed, and you know it's a hugely powerful tool. Of course, and it's but it's it's not it's not normally within the sort of traditional list of magicians' methods. You know, there's so so many things that I think are just deliciously soft, but really uh, powerful. So I you know I, I love a good method, but probably my sense of what what to me is a good method may not be um, anybody else's idea of satisfying. Well. <laughs> In Sack's sleight of hand, he says that patter should be like piano accompaniment to a singer. It should be subservient and not dominate. Do you agree with Sax? Oh, no, I don't. No, I don't. I don't. I remember um, David Copperfield came to see the show in, um, when I was doing Broadway. 
And first time I met him, he was incredibly charming and lovely. And um, he sort of, uh, he, he made a very a sweet, very good-natured remark that there was an awful lot of talking um, <laughs> in the show, uh, which I suppose makes sense. Um, no, I, I think, um, well, for, not for me. I, I, for me, the... It, the even the very idea of patter it's like something like we talk about participants being so when we talk about um oh, spectators spectators yeah. spectators being spe- like it's just this sort of weirdly peripheral role that they're just watching you being clever um so uh, and likewise the idea of patter just being this sort of fill in um i don't think i don't think i don't think that it, that model doesn't work for mentalism it might work for a lot of magic but it's all it's all in the words isn't it and the um the the, you're creating a story, and they, that's that's how I see it. My kind of toolkit is the the sort of story that people are telling themselves in the audience. Yeah. So it's all about it's all words and timing and all, you know all the other things. It's um, uh, I don't know. I think to me, it's absolutely dead dead central. Do you get nervous before shows still? And if you do, how do you deal with it? I I don't really get nervous. What I find is for the first week or so, we're changing the show like every every night so much because the audience tell you what what's wrong with the show, right? They start mm-hmm. coughing when they're not interested, or they you know don't laugh as much as you thought at this bit, or they're shuffling around, whatever. You, you sort of they tell you. So that means for the first week. Well, we, that audience first arrived, we're like, okay, big changes, big changes. So um, every night I'm going out and uh, having to do a different one-man show, more or less. There's mm. probably like a, probably a good third of the show will be very different every night. Um, so I, I kind of have a sort of... Um, uh, I don't quite know how to describe it. It's not really nerves, but it's a very focused... Um, thing whereby um all the kind of you know the the guys that are setting the props and the i'm I'm slightly kind of a little bit like you know getting a when you try and put a cat in a bath you know that (laughs) a a, a, a bit a bit of me is like that um but over the years i've learned and this is something that um my manager said to me uh michael vine said to me one night uh uh, really early on, in fact, I think it was the very first show I ever, I ever did. He just put his head around the door and said, "Enjoy it," and that, that is so. It's such a simple thing, but it's it stayed with me, and I always make sure. And you have to do it quite consciously sometimes. A, when writing a routine, how is this going to be enjoyable for me to do? Because there are some routines that are just boring to do, or you just don't like yourself in that role doing it. Mm-hmm. So how how do I enjoy it? But also. You know, if, if a show is sort of feeling a bit stressy because there have been so many changes, how am I going to go out and really love this experience? And that's not just about yourself. It's it's like that's integral to the show being a good show. You know, if you're not if you're not enjoying it, no one else is going to. So um, uh, I I've learned ways of nipping that in the bud and going. It, you know, things have gone wrong. Everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. Of I've course. gone wrong, failed so many times in so many different ways, and it just doesn't matter that much. Uh, really, because the sh- overall the show will be good, and you know, uh, so I've learned to not not sweat it uh, too much. So now I don't get that nervous. I'm very I'm very comfortable on stage. I think the the, only, the times I do get nervous are if I'm doing something like a chat show and I'm waiting in, waiting around for your name to be called because there's nothing you can do. You're just in the wings, wait, waiting for... I hate I hate that. I think that's a very common experience. I think that's sort of uh, quite a normal thing. But no, not in terms of doing the show. I don't think you do agree to do this, but if you were at a restaurant or a party or people around your house and someone asked you to show them something, mm. how do you respond because I don't think you do show people things. So how do you get out of it? I don't. I don't. I, I don't do it in real life at all. Um, but you must uh, be asked to do stuff all the time. So how yeah, do you politely no, no, decline? No, I'm not. No, it's a, it's a weird thing. Um, I'm not. I don't remember. The last, the last time I can remember was probably 15 years ago. Um, oh. And uh, I was at a table in a 
restaurant, and a guy came over from quite a big table of corporate looking blokes, and he came over and said, um, uh, oh, it's Darren Brown, isn't it? And you come over and just show some stuff to the guys here. And I really <laughs> loved, really loved it. I'm literally, you know, eating. Really loved to see something. Um, uh, and I said, oh, I sort of, I mean, he was just kind of rude. Uh, and I, I sort of said, um, I said, oh, thanks. I, if it's all right, it's, it's my night off. And, and then he went back and went, oh, it's his night off. And they all sort of laughed. <laughs> that, was, that was stuck in my mind. Um, I think that was the last time. I, so I just don't, And but whatever I've, however, I don't know how it is that I've positioned myself in people's consciousness, but people don't ask. Um, uh, and I think if somebody did, I mean, I have, I've really got, there are a, a couple. Of, there are a couple of things. If push comes to shove, <laughs> over the years that I've loved, but I've always had this rule that I would, I can't, I could not bring myself to carry any props with me or, any, or anything like that. So if I was ever going to have anything, it would just have to be something I could do completely impromptu. Mm-hmm. In fact, one of the things I write about. There's a few tricks in the book, and one of them yeah. is was my version of what you could do with that with the ring flight. Um, uh, because that, that was a prop I always used to carry, because it was what I carried my keys on. And I I just ended up really... I bought myself a really nice little leather key pouch, so I liked it. And I thought, well, I've, I've got this, mm-hmm. but it doesn't... It, it could, how on earth do you make that a mentalist trick? <laughs> so um, after a lot of um, sitting and thinking and chatting, I, I sort of came up with something which is, which is uh, in the book. Um, but uh, I don't very often really do that, because I don't get myself into that position. Um if it felt like I was at a table and it just felt like, oh, this would actually go down really well and people would appreciate it and maybe I will, then I might do. But I don't because it's such a shift in m- mood and attention and mm. whatever my personality or role has been in that group until that point is is about to drastically change if I do that. So I just don't. Um, and, and then it's been so long since I've done anything sort of close up that I then start to feel a bit like I've lost the muscle for it, which is um, a shame. And then I, then I go through periods of thinking I'd I'd love to rediscover it. I'd love to sort of get back into it. And I just sort of don't. Um, But yeah, I have, I have a couple of things, but I just generally, I haven't been asked for so long. And uh, I, but I don't, I mean, I, I don't actually have a neat, nice get out if i was asked i'd have to mumble something about it being my day off again and then i just feel awful i mean i've remembered that guy for 15 years sure. so uh, it would always and he probably me. still slags you off yeah he probably is right now as we speak <laughs> it's probably his number one story <laughs> his um, only story um, <laughs> now as you've just got on about that that you, you kind of fell out of love with card magic but i'm just curious if you can remember what the last magic trick or magic book you bought was i haven't fallen out of love with card magic a good card trick is still wonderful it still gets me but i just find it's i'm i'm lost i'm out of the game so so soon with most magic um and i realize at the moment it's about the magician and this is just because I've been overexposed to it. It's not because this is bad. This is bad magic. Everyone else is part. But the moment it's sort of okay, pick a card and look. I'm going to put it. In, it I'm, I'm lost. Um, it's one of the reasons why I really like the um, card at any number sort of plot or the idea of it and why it's the it's the only card trick I sort of stuck with um, since kind of just realizing I sort of moved away from it because the premise of that begins with you, you the participant you know whatever you making decisions and uh, being asked questions about what you and that's it it sounds a little thing but it's actually i think uh, I, I noticed that that if i was seeing a trick where i was being asked what my favorite car was or what i thought that, uh, that totally changed my relationship to it and suddenly i was much more likely to be involved so i thought okay well that's interesting if that appeals to me that's something if i'm ever going to do any card magic i should make sure it's the case um so uh but the last book i got was the um the the uh, posthumous uh eugene Berger volume which i haven't read through i started it and was really loving it and then i moved house and it all got put in storage and i haven't gone back to it 
But um, I was really enjoying that. Um, oh, that's I fairly recent. I thought it would have been ages ago. But, well, before that, it was it was David Burglass's The Burglass. Oh, right, OK. The, the that's quite a number. big gap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then before that, I mean, I... Well, I road. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> oh, Tarbell, I have no idea. Yeah. Now, it's funny you mentioned that. The, 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 the card at any number, but the, the, you've chastised, or maybe a strong word, magicians for doing card magic, making it all about them. And you're, I heard you in an interview say that you're, as the spectator, just a warm prop, which was a delightful turn of phrase. Um, and which I, I don't think is mine, by the way. I'm sure. Oh, OK. Well, I've, either way. I've heard that from someone else. OK, well, let's yeah, fight. we'll get the great. crediting. Tom Mullica, yeah. maybe. Let's say it's him. Yeah. Um, what can people do to stop making it about them? I, well... Uh, to me, that's just sort of, it's its everything, and it's the big question. I think your magic cannot be trans... It, it can't be anything other than transformed when it, when it stops being about you. It cannot be a magical experience for the person taking part if it's if it's just about you, the, the performer. Um, uh, and it's... Uh, I think it's a really fine line, but also my sensitivity to it isn't going to be the same. I've, I've, I've watched magicians, I think, well, that was that was a bit... That was all a bit self-aggrandizing, but the person I've been with who, who isn't a magician has just absolutely loved it. So my, I don't think my opinion really counts for much. It's only my it's only my taste. Of course. But it's just for me the 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 starting point. In fact, there's a there's a chapter in the book about effects. Um, that I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example because it's um, just a thing in the book. Um, and it was the thing with the ring the ring flight. So there's a uh, I was thinking. I got into this. I got into thinking about magic tricks where you wouldn't be around for the um, for the climax, right? Um, and it's partly because I always found it a bit awkward. How do you soak up the kind of oh, mm-hmm. like you just want to give people an experience, and somehow it was you know perhaps a bit awkward or could be killed by people feeling they had to go. Oh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the idea of you um, somebody stops you and says oh can you show me a trick and um this was this was a thing i could do in people in the street and uh i would say um oh we've 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 met before we have we've had this conversation before do you remember and they'd say no sorry no, we were in timpsons you were getting your front door key card do you remember and we had this we spoke and we said we'd meet some do you not remember any of this no Show me your front door key. So they'd get their front door key out, and then the effect would be I'd take it and I'd throw it off the bridge we were on or drop it down a manhole cover and um, and just get rid of it. I wouldn't vanish it. I would just drop their, get rid of their key. It's gone. Um, and uh, I said, do you not remember any of this when we met before? No. Okay. We, you got your key cut, and I got you to make an extra key for me, and I said we would meet again here... Um, it was like six years ago or something. And, you, and then I go out and I fish out, go through my keys. There you go. That's what's your address again? They tell me the address and I'm going through the keys. That one, I think it's, a, it looks very similar to yours. It's not quite the same. It hasn't got the owl on the front like yours has, but that should open your front door. Anyway, nice to see you again. And we'll do this again. Uh, I think it's in three years and it'd be back at the same spot and you won't remember again, but anyway, I'll see you in three years. Bye. And I go, and then they've got the whole <laughs> journey home with this key going, hello, Darren Brown on my front door. Key. And then that lovely moment when they put it open. In the you know the, in the in their lock and it opens their front front door and um, anyway so but to me that's like a, that's not about me then it's about it's purely about it's sort of about me I suppose but it's not really it's about no. their yeah weird experience of um, going up to the door so that that's that's um, I th- I think there is there's the ch- the whole fun of it and the challenge of it for me is how can this experience be more than just me showing off and that's that's not um saying anything about um other magicians there's plenty of great wonderful fun brilliant brilliant creative magic that is sort of about the magician showing off it just doesn't matter because it's just wonderful um i i just it's just personal taste but i um of course i am because i do so little of it but now really in terms of close-up but the the 
that there was a thing when I was on tour doing uh, Showman, that, and I was seeing uh, we had Andy Frost and uh, Bradley Hodgins, uh, Alex Hansford on tour, this wasted moving uh, bits of props around on stage, but they would sit around and just show each other magic, and um, uh, so it got me thinking about what I'd like to do, so I kind of, you know, what what a new close-up thing would be, and I was kind of imagining a trip where I'd Someone would sit and there'd be a cup and a little ball of paper or an object, maybe something I could do in a cafe. We'd hold hands and we'd close our eyes. When they'd open their eyes, the little, you know, the ball of paper would be on top of the cup or it would be under the cup and we'd close our eyes and do it again. And maybe the cup's in, you know, just something that would be completely about this weird experience for the person. That not, it, you know, there are ways of doing it that aren't just look at my skills. Um, there can be, I, I don't think it's that difficult and I think it's a much more interesting um uh project and um uh and hard but of course it should be hard you know yeah. magic sort of it's sort of easy really and i think setting these challenges for ourselves that you know make it more difficult i mean you're going to just disregard 90 percent of good ideas because they don't quite hit this sweet mm -hmm. spot that you're after i think that should be a part of any good creative process completely agree complete but that's that's it isn't it <laughs> going through all of the methods for a certain plot and disregarding the things that don't resonate with you is something that everybody should do when they're trying to learn a new trick um your new book notes from a fellow traveler which you have alluded have to yeah. earlier a couple of times which is subtly though yeah, very very subtly it. i've just gone straight yeah. in with the plug segment yes. Thank now you. no you're very welcome um for me, a bit of the takeaway, or the main takeaway I had, that it's not really... Because, yes, there's a couple of tricks. Um, but people may think, well, if, if, the, if tricks aren't explained, then it's a theory mm. book. Because that's your options with magic, really. Mm. There's tricks or there's theory. But it's not a theory book at all, but I, for me, in any, no, the tra a, tra a, traditional sense. It's a performance book. Yeah. Really, I, I, I just thought there's this whole wodge of stuff that is so important about performing. And also not just performing, but writing and how you get a show together. And um, that's massively important. It doesn't matter if you're doing a, It's not about doing a big show for a few thousand people. It's also you might be thinking about doing a little show above a, above a pub or not, or just doing close up. Or um, it really doesn't matter. But there's so much to be said that just isn't said normally, isn't written about, isn't thought about. Um, and for me, it's the stuff that I live and breathe, really. I, I don't... Um, I, 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 it's the stuff that provides all the joy and fun and makes it the best job in the world for me. So, yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to impart. So you're right, it's not a theory book and it's not really a book of tricks, although there are some. I wanted to put some tricks in there just so people couldn't say, oh, no, there aren't any tricks. I didn't want, them, I didn't want that to be a, a thing. So, no, there are some. Angry people on the Magic Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> um, you clearly think a lot about the why for a trick that why yeah. you have that power why you're showing them why the thing works yeah. like getting slapped in the face doing the speed counting yeah. thing etc 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 is there a process you use for finding yes. that why yes i ask will you tell I us ask, what it I is i ask i ask why <laughs> that is so insightful darren it and is. that's why you're the man it's been that lovely you are talking today. To you. thanks very much bye um but no it is it is as simple as that and i think the um it, the the why question is at every level of uh, um, why Why is this trick in the show? Well, first of all, when we start writing a show, which we are about to do, I don't know when this podcast will go out, but we're currently um, beginning to get our heads around this uh, new show called Only Human, which will be touring in 2025. Um, I haven't written a word of it yet, and people are, people are buying tickets already, which is a bit odd, but I kind of got used to that. Um, but... Um, yeah, I'm going to come uh, and see it in Brighton. <laughs> thank you. No idea what you're going to say. It could be anything. Um, so, uh, the, but the first question is why, why? Why are we doing the show? Like, what's what's the what's the beating heart of the show? What's the what is the reason for staging another uh, show? And that, that isn't about <laughs> making money or it's about what, what I mean by that is what's the what's the sort of 
what's the thing that people are taking away? How are people a little bit different or changed? Or so, what's the thing you go away with at the end? Yeah. So that's like a really big. That's the broadest question. That's that's a kind of a why question, and then. For each trick, we'll come up with, you know, um, some tricks that are born straight out of that why theme. And some tricks will just be, oh, wouldn't it be great to do, like, psychometry in Sherman? Mm-hmm. Like, we haven't done psychometry. So then it's like, well, why why are we doing psychometry? So how right. is that? And if it can't, if it doesn't fit the why, if it doesn't really have a place, then it, it goes. It doesn't matter how great it is. Um, but hopefully we can make it. That, at that level, you can normally make a, a, a trick. Uh, fit, but then as, once you're into the trick, then it's you know why why am I saying this? Why are we why are we doing this? Why and then you know down, why am I taking this object? Why am I right down to those sort of very actory things of what's my motivation? Why am I dying? turning? To, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. But all, all those things are what make a show make sense, and uh, you know they're they're um, it's. It's the kind of it's such an it's such an important question because without it, a show would be a series of tricks, mm-hmm. um, and without it, the tricks wouldn't make any sense. It would be difficult to follow, and you know, so you ha- you can't you can't avoid the question. But I think the more you ask it, the more cohesion you get within a show, and the more if you know if you're hiding methods within a performance, which of course you are, then that really. You have to ask that. You know, you can't, um, you know, if, if you know you've got to go over and do something over here to hide a method and there's no other way of doing it, you need a really good, clear answer to the why as to why you're walking over there and doing that, right? Um, it can't just be a thing you sort of add on. Um, it needs to be utterly uh, utterly motivated. Um, and... I just think those things are, yeah, are, are, um, are so important and not always obvious. And um, I remember in, um, it was infamous and we had this, the show was infamous and we had a big uh, set change and fif- it was actually 52 seats came forward. Like there mm-hmm. were these, um, it was like almost a studio audience looking set up would come forward at the end of Act 1, and it was a it was going to be a set-up for a card at any number effect in the second half, so 52 people would come up and sit on the chairs. Um, and then we ditched the trick, because there were too many card tricks, it felt like, in the second half, which was only three, whatever, it was too many. So um, we had to... But we had these... We had these seats which we had to use because it was you know we spent a lot of money on them we had to use the seats for something so that was that was a why you know why what well we're doing this trip because we need to fill these seats but um <laughs> spent the money on it, them. yeah but it then became um we sort of had to as often happens have to come up with a new trick during the day and then do it in the evening and i i did i looked at them and thought well okay forget the fact they're 52 for a minute hopefully no one's counting it does look like a studio audience so maybe we could do mediumship because that was around the time that those sorts of shows were quite popular on TV and John Edwards and people would mm. do their horrible brand of TV studio mediumship. So then it became getting people up and giving a mediumship reading. But why? Like, why would I be doing mediumship in the middle of this show? And um, did, that didn't quite make, make sense, but we sort of didn't have much choice because we had to think of something and that was it was a relatively technically quite an easy Mm -hmm. thing to put together um so we did and then this sort of the routine became about a kind of um telling people i was lying to them as i was doing it and saying i'm getting a message from your auntie jill is that her name yes and she and i'm not really obviously i'm just making this up but she's saying to me and she's not saying anything, I'm lying to you, but she's saying that you've just painted your bedroom blue. Yes, I, you know, but this strange, like, I'm lying to you, but then telling you stuff that I couldn't possibly know. And it created this really interesting um, sort of uh, feel to the whole routine that was, again, why those disclaimer type questions of, are you saying it's real or not? They're not the point. The point is what theatrical space you create by what you're doing. And this this third space of he's saying it's fake, but it is, you know it was really interesting. So that sort of ended up in a in a less than obvious way becoming a sort of a why. But mm. it, it sort of found its it found the re- its reason for being in the show because it just created this really interesting, weird sort of um, 
tension, you know, which was which was which was great. So sometimes it's you know it's not necessarily obvious, and sometimes you find it by doing it after a few nights, and then you find the reason why it exists and why you love it, and then you you lean into that a bit more, and then you let that you know settle and become probably the heart of it. In the book, you mentioned about the the endings of your shows and it being a story and finding an emotional message you want them to leave the theatre with. Um, mm. How do you begin to think about what that emotional message is? Because I've heard you talk that you have to come up with the name of the show very far in advance and then you think, yeah. oh, shit, what, what are we going to do now? So yeah. how do you go from name of show to yeah, yeah. feeling? Uh, there's not an easy answer to that. Um, but over the, um, over the years, the fact there isn't an easy answer is normally the, um, the key to what makes something work. That it's a, it's a difficult thing to get right because it means you're always starting from scratch every time mm. with the importance, with the important stuff, which is, which is important. So yeah, we do have to come up with a poster and the moment we're like, let's do a show next year, we will need a poster for the brochures that are going to advertise a year ahead and all of that. Course. So we have to, I have to come up with a title and an image but all the, uh, without a sense of what the show is. But weirdly, it then gives you a, it then gives you a sort of, a sort of a, um, a, a, a begins to give you a sort of a framework. Uh, like, oh, that's what the show looks like now. That's the poster. That's what people are expecting. So, okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So that it gives you a starting point, bizarrely. Um, so, uh, that's how that bit works. And then it is the first question. I think what we've, what we're sort of doing, so with this show at the moment, so we are right now, we haven't had a single writing meeting for it, but there's been a couple of very loose conversations. And what I've sort of brought to the table to kind of kick things off, because ultimately it's going to be up to me to go, I think the show should be about this and because I've got to do it every night, you know, sure. so I want it to be about something I care about. Mm. Um, so I've gone, here's a theme I think is wonderful and interesting and we haven't touched on yet. So that's, that's I've sort of gone there and then, then here's a couple of other, here's a, here's a thing that also I think is interesting, which wouldn't be the main theme of the show because it doesn't have an emotional heart, but it's, it's kind of like an interesting head thing, which mm-hmm. again, I haven't really touched on and I find it interesting. So that's that. And I'm quite looking forward to doing a lot of reading around it and just sort of throwing myself into that a bit more. So I think that could be a thread and maybe that. And then this other thing, this more emotional heart will find a way of coming together. And then, um, and then also I think finding, a, a um, another sort of, big um this is more like the uh not so much the would be the message of the show but the kind of at a very experiential level what sort of thing people are watching because mm-hmm. you know it's, this is like 11 shows in now and you want to surprise people you want to over deliver yeah, yeah. every time and have people coming away going oh my god i wasn't expecting that and you know um so we're sort of also thinking about Oh, we haven't done, and it's not about tricks. It's not like the second like, half just, of what's it being the Q and A act. Like that was yeah, that was a, or, that was quite a surprise. That's like a big yeah, it? a big broad blah thing. Yeah. Or you know, in Showman, at the end you realise oh the whole thing's, uh, it's like he didn't get to have a funeral for his dad, which. Um, Obviously, my dad's still alive. That was just a show, but um, that's not true. Um, but um, but you know, he, so actually, you get to the end and you realise, oh, oh, but but that that's that's what the show that that's the big broad book. It's nothing mm. to do with the trick. It's just oh, we, yeah, dad didn't have a funeral, and actually, the show bizarrely has become uh, a tribute to him and a sort of replacement for the funeral and, and so on. So I'm finding what those big, just broad, <laughs> this is the, this is what the show is going to be about, um, which is slightly different from the kind of messages of it as well. Anyway, so we just, we start to talk about those things. And sometimes, um, you know, the, the hardest one was um, Secret, which was the one on Broadway, but mm. it, it kind of went under the name Underground here because, uh, which was a best of, like a yeah, best I of Yeah, I saw the preview branch. in London before you went to, 
That's America right. So it. we knew in America, we, we should, well, we'll just take the best bits from all the mm-hmm. shows and put together the best possible Darren Brown show. Um, but to do that here and sort of essentially really run it in and have it find its feet, it had to be a Darren Brown. It had to be a best of show. Um, and it was interesting because doing, putting a show together like that, there was no heart to it. it that was yeah. because there was, the starting point wasn't let's make this show about dad dying or let's make this show about whatever. It, it was just like, well, the best bit. And then we were actually, the show was starting uh, off Broadway on stage. And it was sort of, I said, I don't really, the only theme here is look at me, aren't I clever? Which I always think is such a, you know, such a shame to have at its heart. And it just, then it occurred to me, um, sort of, I think it was like a good couple of weeks in. Of, oh, I might be misremembering the timing, but it definitely felt like it was up and running. And I remember thinking, oh, I realise now what the show's about. It's about the fact that magic shows us that our experience of the world doesn't match up to reality. Now, if you see a trick and you're fooled by it, you realise, oh, my, what I thought was real isn't. Like, there's more going on that I've missed. And actually, that's a really valuable thing to realise about life, you know. So, and up until then, I think the only interesting thoughts about magic was that it maybe it transports us like to back to a state state of wonder or you know the, there was like a, a limited number of things to sort of take because we want to make this childish thing feel yeah, important yeah, yeah. right and a bit sort of hit me and, and then and then it's like maybe that's that is what the show's about and then you can start to uh bring that theme in and place a bit of it here and a bit of it there and a bit of it here and introduce Get through objects lines and... objects and that yeah that can create that feeling very subtly so people go away with a sense of oh the whole show was about this thing and weirdly it wasn't it was a thought that occurred two weeks in and and you sort of you put it in retrospectively so there's a um and again it's all stuff i write about i think it's actually really interesting and important because you want to make your show emotionally impactful but you don't want to beat people over the head with something and or outstay your welcome in terms yeah. of you know sounding a bit preachy or whatever so yeah. um uh all these things are are um important but they're always they're always difficult to get right there's no easy template there are some things that we've sort of found a bit of a template for but then we will purposefully break with it so that other people don't find it too familiar. But that stuff, the kind of big stuff, it just sort of, it isn't other than I I hope the stuff I've thought about or written about, whatever, just during the year or two in between is will provide me with a theme that will be interesting and remain interesting enough to me yeah. at least for the next yeah. year of touring. Now, most people that come to vanishinginkmagic.com do not mm-hmm. do big touring shows. They might. What? I know. We have to. I know. I'm Lazy. Sorry. I know. Lazy. I don't. I don't mean to disappoint yeah. you. And I, yeah. I imagine that, in fact, most a lot of them don't do shows. So, what's in the book for them? Um, I, I wanted to write it for. Um, although it's, although it's, it, it's sort of it's principally for people that are, maybe putting together a, a show of, of any size, as I said, like 12 people in a room or a bigger show. Because it just struck me that more and more people are doing that now. It was unusual. When I started doing um, magic in theatres, other than maybe sort of Paul Daniels and people, veteran people, historically, uh, it was sort of an unusual thing. And now, mm. you know, you go to Edinburgh and it's all magicians. So it's a, it's a common thing nowadays. Um, so I wanted to write this book principally for those people that are thinking about doing that sort of thing. Right. But it's also a book for, you know, for any any magician that just wants to think about the performance side of stuff and the the richness of that and and how to perform better. And I think it applies it applies across the board. And I've had a lot of people that aren't magicians that are, but are actors or performers in other areas that have also taken a lot from it. Um uh, and a big portion of the book also is just a it's just a journal of touring sure. and the just the the real life experience of what that is and stuff going horribly wrong and weird you know the, uh, I remember one woman getting her head stuck to the table in the um, in the interval up in the bar because she'd she hadn't been on stage but she just responded to some hypnotic 
thing that was kind of in the air in the first half and I had to deal with that and I couldn't and then I'm doing the second half of the show thinking there's a woman upstairs with her head stuck to the table and, and I have to go and see her after. Um, so just there's a, just a, a lot of it is just simply that sort of, you know, the, the reality of touring. Um, uh, uh, but really for me, it's, it's just lessons. It's lessons learned. It's all about mistakes I'm making, things I've learned over the years. And I, I think whatever you're doing in magic, at whatever sort of um, level, it's certainly not a book I expect, people to read if they're doing shows for thousands of people. I think it's helpful if you are, but probably by that point, uh, you've thought about a lot of these things. So um, a- anybody performing, uh, or even if you're not really performing, but you just think it's important to get this kind of stuff right. And I, yeah. I don't think there's an awful lot written about this particular important aspect of it. I don't think there is. Um, as we're on the subject of books, what are some books that you would consider essential reading? for anyone who is or wants to perform magical mentalism? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I really don't know. There are the classics, Animan and um, 13 Steps, and the... But they were the classics for me, and they were, like, essentials Mm. for people of my age... um, when I was starting in magic, which was 1930, whenever that was. Um, but I, um, uh, it's really hard to say nowadays. I mean, I think... There isn't a 13 Steps or, or uh, Corinda. Or they, 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 no. hasn't, that, they haven't been updated for... There's a wonderful book called Notes from a Fellow Traveller oh, by yes, Dar- Darren it. Brown. I love that, um, Darren Brown. He's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I think it's... Um, I mean, uh, I hate to sound like a, a man of a certain age, but there is a lot to be said for um, going back to those... I don't know exactly how this sounds, but go, going back to those old ideas, particularly with mentalism, because it's become... Everything is such a shortcut. All this electronic stuff, mm-hmm. um, which uh, is really clever and exciting, and if I was doing the odd close-up gig, I might even be tempted to use it, but is a total non-starter if you're a professional performer every night because you you, you want to be responsible for your miracles you don't want something that could fail and leave you not you're just stuck you know and if you've got a backup method in the air then just just use the backup method Mm -hmm. um so uh i um the 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 joy of those old-fashioned things is that they if you strip away the aura around them um, are that uh, they really work? There was, a, there was a reason why they, you know, stuck around. I was mm. really reluctant to do the Q and A, to do that Oracle Act. I think it was Andrew O'Connor that suggested it because it was literally here's a big mentalism thing we haven't done, and at that point, no one was doing Q. Well, again, historically, of course, people were, and people were doing it. I mean, no one was doing it, but it wasn't. It no, wasn't hot. It seemed to, yeah. No, it was just a niche thing that you're just aware that some sort of vaguely old-fashioned performers did and still did and it just felt a bit like an old man's thing and it was it was magnificent to do i don't mean to watch but to <coughs> to do and to realize the power of it and um it was just such a joy and you kind of got oh i i see i see why this had so much power in its day and, and still has so um and that's about that's about an effect. It's not about a clever, a clever, you know, method. No, it's um, the plot. It, it really is. So uh, there's a lot in them, the books. Oh, um, books. But yeah, I really, I honestly, I don't know. I mean, do people even I'd, read I'd, books? I'd take old, I'll know. take old books as, as, as a good answer. Yeah. Um, your scallop and whatever it was, burgers are calling. Um, so I, I realise we're, we're getting close to that. Now, we always end the show... To cook. We always end the show with four quickfire questions. And to change things up, before Ooh. I ask the questions, we're going to play a game called How Well Do You Know Andy Nyman? So, Because I asked him the same four questions. So I'll well, ask you... he obviously knows himself very well, so that would... No, but how, no, no it only works for you. It wouldn't work for him. Oh. Okay. <sighs> So I'll ask you the question, you answer it in Darren's voice, and then you have to guess what Mr. Nyman answered. Okay? Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, got it. Okay. <laughs> Favourite pizza topping? 
Um, I think he'd start with the margarita, and he would add. Um, you see, he's not going to like. You don't like any. He likes a pickle. That man likes a pickle. Doesn't like seafood. Um, doesn't like. Uh, I, I. Do you know? What? I think I might just go a classic margarita. Mm-hmm. Maybe a yeah, basil, perhaps a bit of burrata, something like that. But and he'd be making it himself on his uh, in his pizza oven. <laughs> Very good, very good indeed. Was that and, correct? Yeah, that way he said. I... He said, if he's making it, and he makes them a lot, it's a margarita. If yeah, he's yeah. getting it from Domino's, it's tuna sweet corn. Tuna sweet corn. So I'll take. I'll, I'll give you that as a win. What's your answer? Oh, I uh, for me it's classic sort of pepperoni. If you want a pizza, you want that pizza to me. I don't. I have no truck with uh, fancy. I, I'll stretch to a hot honey. And chewing okay. so sort of thing, variations mm-hmm. on that, but absolute still just classic tarty yeah. pepperoni, isn't it? Really, Ta- tarty pepperoni. <laughs> <laughs> favorite movie, and his favorite movie. Oh mm-hmm. God! All right, it'll be a um, it'll be a classic sixties mm-hmm. or seventies sort yep. of like yep. action thriller, um, something like. Um, Get Carter or mm. the Italian job. Or Le- one of less kind thriller, of, pr- less thriller, got, less thriller, it, but right decades. It'll have Gene Hackman on Michael Caine in it, <laughs> um, and uh-huh. uh, it'll probably considered a horror. But I don't think it'd have gone for a horror as a favourite movie. Or maybe it's. Hmm? Oh, don't look now. Is it? I, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know. Um, Who's Jaws? Jaws, yeah, brilliant, of course, yeah. And you your go. response, sir? Oh, my my favourite movie. I, uh, if I'm allowed a trilogy, I yes. really like the um, no, before no, sunset, no. before sunset, before sunrise, before midnight uh, trilogy by Richard Linklater. I love those. I, I, single movies, maybe. Um, Wings of Desire by Vin Vendors, mm-hmm. or maybe Magnolia, the P.T. Anderson film. Okay. I'll go with those. Thank you. Um, Favourite person or people who make music? I warn you, Nyman struggled with this. Yeah. Um, I struggle with that one because he's phenomenal at coming up with music. Oh, pretty much all the music in the shows comes from Andy with some weird thing on his phone he's got. Going, what about this? And it's perfect. He's, he's extraordinary with music. And they're all people you just... Never heard of that are awesome. ex- just brilliant. Um, <laughs> Everyone so needs I, a friend like that. Yeah, I don't know. He might have said Charlie O'Connor to be okay. kind, who's An- Andrew O'Connor's son, uh, who did phenomenal music for Unbelievable. Um, but I don't know. I think it would be um, some kind of funky... Um, Oh, no. Anthony Newley. Maybe he'd have said Anthony Newley. He said the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. Oh, yes. Yeah, which I had not heard I, of, but then went that, and listened to no, afterwards. And Johnny now he's, yeah, now he said that, absolutely, yeah. I've are heard, you, I've you, heard, you, heard him say that before. Are you in a position to answer that question? Favourite person or people who make music? I'm a huge fan of Rufus Wainwright, and when mm-hmm. I paint, uh, which I'm doing a lot at the moment, I listen to him. Leonard Cohen, maybe, I'd probably say. Um, and also there is a, a, a classical pianist called Vikingur Olafsson, which I'm sure I'm saying wrong, um, who I'm uh, very heavily into at the moment as well, but not when I'm painting. So if I'm writing or doing something else, it's Vikingur Olafsson. If I'm painting, it's probably Leonard Cohen yes. or Rufus Wainwright. And finally, who would you mm-hmm. rather fight, one massive Andy Gladwin or a hundred tiny Joshua Jays? Uh, I, uh, I'd, I'd rather fight a hundred tiny Joshua Jays. Okay. Um, because then I could punch him really hard in the nose and he'd have to have it replaced again. Okay. And and what do you think Mr. Nyman chose? 
he would fight a massive Andy Glavin because it's that that prize fighter thing is not about the fight a, a tiny. No, un- un- unhesitatingly, without a second's pause, he he agreed with you, and a hundred Chinese Joshuas would be more fun. To oh, did he? I'm surprised. I'm surprised. Yeah, I'm no, no, yeah, he, okay. he he took the yeah. he took the easy route. Um, Darren Brown. Mm. Thank you so much for giving us so much of your time. It's been an absolute delight. And your new tome is available at furnishingigmagic.com. Um, when does the tour start? When have you got to write this stuff by? Oh, God. Uh, I think it starts at the beginning of March. I'm really trying not to think about it. Um, <laughs> that but, doesn't um, seem awfully yeah. far away. No. Um, uh, sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Um, uh, yeah, start, start of March, uh, and it stretches through till, um, till September. I can't wait. It'll be, it, it's the best, wonderful, uh, most wonderful thing. And I've taken a year off from all of that stuff, so I'm really looking forward to it. But yeah. And should people March. want to buy tickets, where should they go? I've literally no idea, but I imagine if you go to derrenbrown.co.uk, there'd be some link there because it would be. Um, it would be, it'd be a miss if, if, it would be a miss if there wasn't something on my website you'd have to talk to the people that do the things <laughs> have serious stiff words, stiff words. <laughs> Darren Brown thank you very much indeed enjoy your dinner I will thank you so much lovely to talk to you <laughs> thank you